This poem is called To Learn How to Speak, and it's by Jeremy Cronin. And I asked Mbali to space it for me. So it's actually not, it doesn't look like this on the page, right? It's in fact divided into one very long stanza and two lines. But I said to her, please space it so that I can do intensive reading things on it. So that's why it looks like this. Let's just start by reading it. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land, to pause the speech in its rivers, to catch in the inarticulate grunt, stammer, call, cry, babble, tongues not, a sense of the stoneness of these stones from which all words are cut. To trace with the tongue wagon trails, saying the suffix of their aches in curl, pun, fontaine, in watery names that confirm the dryness of their ways. To visit the places of occlusion or the lick in a flay bank dawn. To bury my mouth in the pit of your arm in that planetarium, pectoral beginning to the nub of time, down there close to the water table, to feel the full moon as it drums at the back of my throat its cow-skinned vowel. To write a poem with words like, I'm telling you, Stompy, stick fast, Golovan, Songololo, just boom bang, just to understand the least inflections. To voice without swallowing syllables born in tin shacks, or catch the 515 Equata Past 5 Chuanisburg train to reach the low chant of the mine gang's mineral glow of our people's unbreakable resolve. To learn how to speak with the voices of this land. Right, so, those of you who are studying poetry, I was in a seminar many, many years ago for teachers. And the person running it said, when, you, when you're presenting a poem to a class, obviously for the class it's unseen. But for you it's a seen poem, right? This is going to be a seen poem, it's going to be in the exams, just like this one. This is a foul poem, and for those of you doing poetry for FAL, you will be doing this poem. And it could be in the exams. So this facilitator said, how many times do you read the poem in class? And we said, well, usually once, maybe twice. And he said, and as teachers, how many times have you read this poem? Oh, we said, well, look, a simple poem, five times, a difficult poem, 20, 50, 100. And he said, that's part of the problem. You are throwing a difficult text at students and expecting them to answer intelligently immediately. And he's absolutely right. So why do we do this? Well, I went back to school and I tried it with a, quite a difficult poem that had been set for grade 11. And it took us about 10, 12 times of reading it through before everybody in the class said, I think I've got a handle on this poem. I, I kind of think I understand what it's basically about. So what you need to do is to read the poem through 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times. Now, why don't we do it? Exactly the reason I'm not going to do it now. Because if I read it, I'm looking at the time, if I read it through 15 times, then that's all I do for the rest of the program. So we don't do it because of time. So grade 12s, you need now to read those scene poems through many times. And what is the thing that you start to do? You start after the second or third time, you pick up your pen and you start engaging with the text. So we're using our intensive reading skills. I'm going to leave out the author and the date for the moment. Um, it doesn't tell you when the poem was published, just tells you his, his dates. But you now imagine we're on our fifth or sixth reading. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land. So you say to yourself, well, who's learning? 
And when you've read the poem a number of times, you realize he says to write a poem. And you say, oh, okay. All right, so the person who wants to learn how to speak is the speaker. And let us assume that it is a poet. Why am I assuming that? Because he says he wants to write a poem. Am I assuming that the poet and Jeremy Cronin are the same person? Not at the moment. Do I think that it is? Yes, I do. But on the whole, just talk about the speaker of a poem. And because of that word poem later, uh, we think that this is a poet. So what does he want to do? He wants to write poetry. This is what he wants to do. And he's saying, what kind of poetry does he want to write? Well, obviously he wants to write good poetry. How many poets do you know who think, let me sit down and write a really bad poem today that everybody's going to mock? No, for heaven's sake. So to write good poetry, what does he need to do? He needs to learn how, interesting, to speak with the voices of the land. Interesting. The voices. What does this tell you? It's plural. Use your grammar. Number is plural. He's saying that the land doesn't have one voice. What do we call it these days? What's the term we keep on using? Yes. So he wants to incorporate diversity. Then you say of the voices of the land. Notice for me there's something so the voices of the land, part of it, as if the voices come out of the land. There's a kind of unity, the voices of the land. But on your first reading, what you need to understand is this is separate in the way that it's printed in the text. To learn how to speak with the voices of this land. Ah, this land. So, when you've looked at it, the Ikwata Pass Fife, Johannesburg train, shacks, Songololo, Golovan. What are we looking at? Kaoski, this land, which land? Has to be South Africa. So we go back. He says he wants to learn how to speak. What language is he speaking while he writes? Well, this is predominantly English, but he's saying if I want to write good poetry, I need to learn how to speak with the voices of the land. What does that mean? To speak for all South Africans in a way, how, 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 how is way? In a way that all South Africans will respond, but in a way that represents all South Africans. I've got to be inclusive. I've got to be them and appeal to them and speak to them. And do I know how to do it? No. I need to learn how to speak with the voices of the land. And then he talks about, well, if I'm going to learn how to speak, I need to be able to parse the speech. And so we come to the first word. Now, I do think that this poem is challenging for FAL students, not because its message is challenging, because we've got the message. If you are going to write about South Africa, you need to speak for people, to people. You need to be inclusive have a sense of unity. I speak with you, for you, to you, about you. Yeah, I get, that's the message of the poem. I got it. I got that message in the first two lines. But the words, I think that there are going to be a lot of words that students don't know. And that's going to be a problem. So please won't you look for vocab. I'm going to learn words now. To pause. What does pause mean? Well, if you ask an English teacher, let us say, I am happy.
please pause this. I, personal pronoun, am finite verb, happy descriptive adjective, used attributively. So that's pausing. So for an English teacher, it's dividing up that sentence into its parts of speech in order to understand how something is working. So if I pause, I look at each bit, each word, each section, each piece, I want a better word than bit, and I make sure I understand how it works, how it operates, what, it, what it's doing, what its function is, and how it impacts everybody. That's what I'm doing. So what does he need to be able to do, this poet? He needs to parse the speech. So up to there, parse the speech. Okay. Tsonga, Zulu, Kosa, Venda. I'm getting this. But he doesn't say that. He says to parse the speech in its rivers. Ah. So he's saying that the rivers speak. And he needs to be able to understand each thing that the river says. So he starts with water. We've had land and we move to water. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he needs to understand what the rivers say. To catch. Okay, I get catch. In the inarticulate grunt, stammer, call, cry, babble, tongues not, a sense of the stoneness of these stones, from which all words are cut. Okay, right. What's he trying to understand? He needs to catch, okay, grab onto a sense of the stoneness of these stones, of what makes these stones, whichever stones he's looking at, these stones, what makes them stone. And then he says, the stoneness of the stones from which all words are cut. So there's a link between the land and the language. Language comes out of a people and words are cut out of the stones of the land. They are cut out of the hard experiences of a people's lives in a particular land. Right. Are we okay with that? He wants to catch a sense of that. But look at the words he's used. They're absolutely fabulous. What have we got? We've got grunt, stammer, call, cry, babble, and tongues not. Okay, grunt. What is a grunt? So if I were in my foul class now, I'd say, what language do you speak? Tsonga. What's grunt in Tsonga? What's grunt in Zulu? What's grunt in Kosa? What's grunt in Tswana? So grunt <coughs> is a grunt. Okay, you hit me in the solar plexus. Oh, that's a grunt. Or you know what it's like? You say to your child, um, how was school today? Uh, that's a grunt. Stammer. Stammer is when you don't get the, the words out properly. So you st st uh, you can't get the sound out. Okay? And you you hesitate on that uh, uh, sound until you can get it out. Call you should know. What's the difference between a call and a cry? Please won't you answer that for yourself? Babble. Babble. We say that babies babble. You know what? A little baby goes it doesn't make any sense, all right? People babble when they're excited. Those of you studying Othello, when he arrives in Cyprus, he says, I'm babbling. He's so excited. Um, and there's his wife, whom he didn't expect to see already in Cyprus, and he's so happy to see her again. <laughs> Don't know what I'm telling <laughs> Babbling. Tongues knot. Well, you know what a knot is, like a knot in a piece of string. We say your tongue is knotted when you cannot express yourself clearly, you say, I, I seem to have a knot in my tongue. I was listening to a voice note from one of my students who was trying to say literary project. And she was going, 
Ach, man, I can't say this. Your tongue. Okay, I know that we're falling over words like epibemiology. You hear people saying, I, at least I can pronounce it now. So I, I heard one of the, one of the announcers saying um, on one of the radio stations. So the words that we fall over. So he wants to catch, oh, I didn't do inarticulate. Word attack skill, in, not articulate. When you articulate, you make the sounds very clearly and they are easily heard and understood. That is to articulate. Right, so to catch in the inarticulate, it's not articulate, that when the stones or the land or the rivers communicate, it's with sound, not with easily understood language. So if you're going to catch this, you need to listen very carefully. You need to pay attention to it. So he's looking at various ways that we make sounds. That's what all of this is. So you need to listen to the sounds of the land in order to be able to understand. And he says he wants to trace, trace, to follow. Like if I, if I have a picture and then I trace it, I, I copy it, I copy around. If I say that I am tracing my family history, it means I'm going back following the path. So he's following a path. What is he following? A wagon trail. So you know what, what wagons are. Gosh, I can't draw the wagons. And they had those sort of tops, right? Who? Who traveled in wagons like that? Now I need your history. We're talking about the people who trekked. So that's a nice South African word. Who trekked into the interior. So if this is, this is the Cape down here. They are trekking from Cape Town they go sort of as far as the Hottentots Holland and then you've got the Karoo, so that's quite tricky. So they're moving this way, they're trekking as far as Natal, KwaZulu, and then trekking into the interior. So we're looking at the Afrikaners. So we're going to expect some Afrikaans. Whoa, hang on, that was not meant to happen. Afrikaans, can put the S there. And we get it. Koil. Pan, fontaine. So we're looking at the words, the suffix. These are what they added to the ends of words. So coil is a pit or a hole. A pan, in English we say a pan. You know it's when you've got like the, the, the land is this and in rainy times it forms water. That, that's a pan. Um, and a flay is when you don't expect it um, in the dry season. So pan, again, a, um, a small lake, let's say a, a lake, a pond. And fontaine, that's the source of water. So we're looking at Afrikaans words tied to the trekbura, who trekked into the interior. Now, we've got the first real use of another language and he was talking about speaking with the voices of various people and we've got some Afrikaans coming in. Unfortunately I've basically run out of time so I will pick up this poem next week.